everyone, and welcome to Beth Shalom Congregation. I'm Rabbi Susan Grossman, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our third session of our Interfaith Jewish-Muslim Dialogue Series, Talking About Israel. And we've spoken in the last few weeks about how to uh, talk about Israel in the context of diplomacy and in the context as well of um, the uh, clergy. And this evening we'll be speaking about the context of academics. And it's my pleasure uh, to uh, welcome some of our dignitaries this evening, uh, in addition to our, some of whom are our partners. Of course, uh, the Baltimore Jewish Council, which we couldn't have done this without. Uh, I want to recognize Rizwan Siddiqui and members of the Howard County Muslim Council. And Pearl Offer is here as our immediate past chair of our Howard County uh, Jewish Federation. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, our Beth Shalom Vice President for Adult Education, Tammy Lawrence, to introduce our speakers for this evening. <coughs> This evening we welcome our panelists, Dr. Stephen David and Imam Mohammed Bashar Arafat, as well as our moderator, Dr. Arthur Abramson. Dr. David earned his BA in political science from Union College in 1972. In 1975, he completed his MA in East Asian Studies from Stanford University, and in 1977 received an MA from Harvard University in political science. In 1980, he earned his PhD in political science from Harvard University. He was a postdoctoral fellow in Harvard's National Security Program for the following year. In 1981, Dr. David began his work at Johns Hopkins University as an assistant professor of political science. In 1987, he became an associate professor and became a full professor in 1991. He has served as director of the International Studies Program of JHU. He held the chair of JHU's political science department and was associate dean for academic affairs. In 2005, Dr. David became the vice dean for the centers and programs at Johns Hopkins University, provided oversight for 10 centers and programs. And in 2007, he became the director of Jewish studies at JHU. He served in that role until 2010 when he was named Vice Dean for Undergraduate Education at JHU. Born and raised in Damascus, Syria, Imam Arafat attended Damascus University and graduated with a degree in Islamic Studies and Arabic Language in 1987 and a degree in Islamic Law in 1988. He served as Imam in Damascus from 1981 to 1989 and then was invited to the United States to lecture in various Islamic centers. Currently, he is president of the Islamic Affairs Council of Maryland, based in Baltimore. Imam Arafat taught courses in Islamic studies at the Medical Institute of Theology, at St. Mary's Seminary and University, the University of Maryland in Baltimore County, UMBC, Johns Hopkins University, Boucher College, the Renaissance Institute, as well as comparative religions at Potomac College in Washington, D.C. Currently, he is teaching at the College of Notre Dame in, of Maryland. In addition, he previously served as campus imam of Johns Hopkins University and as the Muslim chaplain for Baltimore City Police Department. Since moving to Baltimore in 1989, Imam Arafat has been heavily involved with interfaith work, both nationally and internationally, promoting better understanding between Muslims and other faith traditions. In 2010, he received the Interreligious Dialogue and Reconciliation Award from Clergy Beyond Borders in Washington, DC. He is the founder and president of Civilizations Exchange and Cooperation Foundation, CECF, which functions as an umbrella to bring people together in a format where exchanges can take place more effectively to create a better world that enjoins peace and cooperation. Dr. Art Abramson, Executive Director of the Baltimore Jewish Council since 1990, was previously the 
Community Relations Director for the Jewish Federation of Greater Houston. Prior to that, he was the Washington State Area Director for the American Jewish Committee, AJC. He also served as an Assistant Area Director for the AJC in its Los Angeles office. Before joining the American Jewish Committee, he taught political science for four years at the University of California at Los Angeles and the California State University at Northridge. His areas of expertise include the international relations and politics of the Middle East, American foreign policy, and American government. A native of New York City, he attended Queens College of the City University of New York, where he received his BA degree. He earned his MA and PhD degrees at UCLA in the fields of political science. Which one of you gentlemen would like to go first? Go first? Please. Okay. okay, I will make a decision. Dr. David. They always pick on the Jews. That's Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, put this down. Is this okay? Is this too yeah. loud? Is all right? Yeah, we um, okay. It's nice to be here. Um, normally, when I talk on the Middle East, uh, it's usually on a substantive issue. I'll talk on the threat posed by Iran, uh, the possibilities of a two-state solution, um, sort of the substance of the Middle East. But they've asked me to be a bit more personal here and asked me what is it like to be a dean and a professor um, who also teaches in the Middle East. And so that's what I'm going to do. And needless to say, if, if, if there are substantive or other questions that people may have after my 10-minute uh, talk, uh, I'd be happy to address them. I mean, a fair amount of my teaching is on the Middle East, is on the Arab-Israeli conflict. And it really is like nothing else, um, in part because it's such an emotional issue. There really is no other issue that you can teach about or talk about on college campuses these days that has as much emotion, as much intensity, as much passion as the Middle East, and especially the Arab-Israeli conflict. Whichever side you're on, uh, people feel very intensely about their point of view. I mean, this makes it exciting as a professor, but it's also sometimes difficult, because part of what you're trying to do is be dispassionate and be objective, and when you're dealing with such highly felt emotions, uh, that, that can be something of a challenge. It's also a challenge in that if you are somewhat supportive of Israel, um, you're going to be in a hostile academic environment. Um, the prevailing view among, I think, most professors, I haven't done a poll, but most professors are not very warm and fuzzy uh, towards Israel. I think they tend to be much more sympathetic to the Palestinian point of view. Um, students are a bit more divided, but again, among the, uh, among the um, professors, uh, there's a good deal of hostility towards Israel. Now, my own politics are, are not all that extreme. I think if I were sitting on the Israeli spectrum, I'd be a kind of center-left uh, person. I believe very strongly in, in the two-state solution. I think Israel should give up most of the occupied territories. I'm even willing to entertain some division of Jerusalem in exchange for peace. But on the academic spectrum, that makes me some right-wing fascist because you know, I, I accept and support the notion of Israel as a Jewish state. So that puts one very much in the minority uh, when, when you're in the academic world. And you know, no one likes to be an outlier, but that's the way it is. Um, I think Hopkins, uh, is better than most, but you know, I talk to a lot of my friends, a lot of my colleagues who are at schools where uh, the professors are mounting, are trying to mount boycotts of Israel, of Israeli scholars, boycotts of Israeli publications, not uh, going to, not having conventions or meetings that would include Israelis. So you're you're in an environment where again you're very much of a minority, and, and that can be a little uncomfortable. 
It's also a bit uncomfortable for me, uh, again, speaking personally, in that I'm speaking, I teach on a subject for which I have some emotional baggage connected to. Most of the students know I'm Jewish, but why? You know, I, but I guess they look at me and, you know, they figure out I'm from the Bronx and, you know, a little nerdy guy, and, and it becomes pretty clear that I'm Jewish. And I'm teaching on subjects on the Arab-Israeli conflict. And you know, I can teach on China, and I can teach on the Balkans, and I can teach on Latin America, and no one's going to say, oh, well, Professor David, no wonder he's you know, saying that about China. He, you know, uh, of course you'd expect him to be pro-Chinese, or you'd expect him to be pro-Yugoslavian, or whatever. So when you're clearly a, a, a Jew or a Muslim, you're teaching in this area, I think students are going to come at you with some preconceived notion that, that this guy is going to be biased. And, and part of my job is to convince them either that I'm not biased or that I'm aware of my biases and can overcome them. But part of the job is also not to bend over backwards so much to show that I'm objective and I'm fair that I'm unfair. Uh, to whatever the Israeli Jewish side might be, assuming one can talk about science. So that, that also is, is a very big challenge. Um, and it's especially a challenge for me in that I'm not only a professor, but I'm also vice dean of undergraduate education. And what that means is that I'm vice dean of all the students. And sometimes I will have students come to, to me, oh, how can Hopkins allow this speaker uh, who is very uh, pro-Arab, or this speaker is virtually anti-Israel. How can you allow such a person to come uh, and speak at Hopkins? And the answer is always clear. I mean, we're a university. And universities are a forum for a wide diversity of views, including views we strongly disagree with. And with very few exceptions, we're going to invite and welcome anyone who comes to talk, whatever their point of view might be. Uh, and some people don't get that, uh, but that is something that I believe strongly in. And I know there are controversies at Brooklyn College and elsewhere, but I mean, universities are one of, hopefully one of the last places where this can happen. And I'm happy to say that at Hopkins, we do have people across the political spectrum. They are not shouted down, uh, whatever their views might be, the way they are at other universities. And finally, just again on a personal note, one of the things I've tried to do, um, somewhat in an extracurricular way, is to bring the groups together, to work with Hillel and, and, and the Arab students' organizations, uh, to create a dialogue. And um, I think at Hopkins, we've got very good relations among the Muslim students, the Jewish students, not because of me, because of people like Debbie Pine, the Interfaith Center, who I mean, work very strongly to make this happen. Um, for three years, I've led a group of Hopkins students and Penn students to the Middle East, uh, where we've traveled uh, to Saudi Arabia and Israel. I think it's one of the only trips that would include Saudi Arabia and Israel on the same itinerary. Uh, this is a group of mixed Muslim, Jewish, some Christian students. And it's been a fascinating journey because uh, you get to see these different cultures and these different places with very different eyes. And, and the students, they usually begin these trips with this notion that, well, you know, we're all brothers and it doesn't matter whether we're Muslims or Jews, we're all the same under the skin and everything is fine. And, you know, then they get to Israel and the Muslim kids, okay, all the Muslim kids over here, special, you know, security uh, briefing. Saudi Arabia, just, just be quiet about being Jewish. Special lines for Muslims, special lines uh, for non-Muslims you get a real sense in a trip like this that your religion is your identity. Whether you believe, it's not a question of faith, it's not a question of belief, it's a question of, of, of who you are in these countries. And you feel, whether you want to or not, very Jewish in Israel, or very Muslim in Saudi Arabia, and it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an eye-opening experience. I mean, one, one funny uh, thing that happened during the trip to share with you, um, one of the students, a bright young woman from Hopkins, she had just come out of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and she looked at me in the tour guide and said, uh, gee, I didn't know Jesus was crucified in the church. <laughs> 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 I said, well, 
So much for a Hopkins education. Uh -huh. Anyway, I do think I, and I'll stop with this, I do think I've been somewhat successful in this, in that, uh, in trying to bring the faiths together, in that on December 29th, uh, two of my students are getting married, um, a, a Jewish student, son of a rabbi, um, a Muslim student, a very religious Muslim, they're, they're getting married together, and since none of their parents want any part of this, they've asked me to officiate. So uh, <laughs> uh, if, if that, that's not bringing the faiths together, I, I don't know what, what is, although I don't think my mother would approve. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Imam Arafat. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, first of all, to, uh, to invite me to be here. It's really an honor and a pleasure. And uh, in these 10 minutes, I just would like to try to speak about the, uh, the law of change uh, in this life. And I would like to speak, since uh, the title is Talk About Israel, I would like to address that topic from also the Islamic perspective. Uh, maybe some of you have read in the Quran that uh, Moses and the Torah is mentioned as the first law revealed by Almighty. Uh, and in the Quran, it speaks about the importance of change. And one of the things I have noticed at, at Hopkins, uh, as a campus imam working there almost close to 10 years, that really uh, so many things has to change and especially the Muslim community in America has to change in order to cope with the academic uh, change, especially for the children of immigrants uh, coming to this country, as well as the students who I had the, the pleasure to, to work with. But uh, teaching, you know, at, uh, right now at Notre Dame and other places, I have seen my students also both the Muslims as well as the non-Muslims are really not aware of so many things uh, here in the United States versus in other places in the Middle East. To your surprise sometimes when I'm teaching this course and I tell them, and I write on the, on the board, for example, uh, Yasser Arafat, half of the students have never heard of that. I write, Hamas. Half of the students have never heard of Hamas. This is something you hear about it all the time in the, uh, in the news. Uh, something like that. I write about something in, in Israel. They have never heard of this kind of thing. Those are the college level students all over the United States, I guess. Um, so I'm really now talking about the generation here in the United States, number one, and I'm talking about a generation in Europe, and I'm talking about Asia, since now I travel to the Office of Public Diplomacy at the State Department to different countries around the world. I'm seeing a change, and I'm seeing that uh, seminary, academic uh, uh, fields, and especially the seminaries are really not addressing the issues of change. And then, when I come back to the United States and I see interfaith and how interfaith is changing in America to an extent where it's going beyond so many countries in the Arab world, I see that a positive change. And then I ask myself, since interfaith is becoming almost made in the U.S., made in USA, interfaith. How much Israel is doing interfaith outside Israel? Because I have seen working with the public diplomacy right now and traveling that a lot of people in, it, I mean, I just came back from Italy last week, I mean, uh, last month, I'm sorry. And when I'm sharing with them the interfaith in America, the people are looking at me like, really? When I share with them my experience at Johns Hopkins at the interfaith center and I just ask, uh, uh, Dr. David about uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Joseph Katz and uh, 
just he, he knows him. We work together. I spoke about my experience with the Interfaith Center and how it changed from that church to a place where the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews are praying. The people are looking, really? They are consumed with Israel and the Palestinian issue, and they are not seeing so many things happening uh, on another side. And that's where I will go back to the law of change in this life, that things are changing. But from my perspective, the Arab world has to change. And you have seen what's happening, but unfortunately they did not have the right tools to change, so we are ending up in the, not the Arab Spring, the fall now, or winter. Uh, and if you just look back, things did not work for, uh, properly and did not move forward because they were not taught how to make a change. They were prevented from making a change. And over these 30, 40 years, if you would like to think of change, you have to either be jailed or chased out of the country or you are in the, in the grave. Uh, this is the situation in the Arab world. I'm seeing now things in Asia, but I come back to America and I see this issue of change is really uh, sweeping all over, but sessions like this is not happening everywhere. And the people, when I'm interacting with them, whether in Europe or in Asia, when you tell them about the Jewish community in America, they think of Israel right away. It's hard for them to separate when I tell them my best friends are rabbis and I work with the Jewish community. They think I'm traitors. They think I'm spy. They think I'm, I'm not a good Muslim just because of the work which I'm doing. This is really a problem for me because the Quran mentions Moses more than 200 times. The story of Moses and the stories of the sons of Israel all over the Quran. But today the people are obsessed with the Palestinian-Israeli issue, obsessed with what Netanyahu said about Iran, obsessed with as if Netanyahu, I'm, I'm talking from my perspective, okay? As if Netanyahu represents the entire Jewish community. I know for sure my friends, the, the rabbis and others, don't believe in so many things happening over there, but for some reason, the people, I'm just telling you honestly, when I'm traveling, how the people are viewing the situation only from the lenses of the Israeli-Palestinian situation. But what about the things are changing in America? How much Israel is picking up on that change globally to do public diplomacy in terms of having clergy from Israel, Muslim and Jewish to, and Christian to travel together the same way we are doing it here in America and traveling. The same way we are doing it here in America and doing all of these interfaith programs, it is a challenge because the world is changing. And from my perspective now, seeing what's happening in the Middle East, yes, it's taking a setback, but give it five years. To me, things are going to move forward again because it cannot continue like that forever. I'm from Syria. And before I come to you, I was talking to a friend of mine who had to spend in the jail several months just because of the name change. And they just messed up his name with another person. But the point is, they, he was told to get out of Syria. And he is in Lebanon, and now he's trying to get his immigration papers to Canada. My point is telling, I mean, when he is telling me about what's happening over there, it, it cannot continue like that. And for me, everything is changing, and Israel has to change in terms of how you approach these issues on a global perspective, not always the Israeli-Palestinian, but the interfaith. Show me diversity in Israel and how you can talk about the law of change in diversity because the Quran, for your information, and that's what I teach, came and was revealed after Jesus, and of course after Moses, to tell the Muslims, 
This is where some of the Christians misinterpreted the words of Jesus. And here where some of the rabbis misinterpreted the teachings of Moses. Oh, Muslims, don't follow on that path. Try to look at the things from the global perspective that God look at it. Look at the whole world as the servant of God. Don't look only from the perspective of Arabs or Muslims. But guess what? Even despite these instructions, some of the Muslims did not follow on that path. In our Muslim history, we have so much problems. And some of these problems, for example, the Umayyad dynasty, it was defeated by the Abbasi dynasty because of the issues of diversity. They did not pick up on the issue of diversity properly, the same way the Quran spoke about diversity, which is the law of change. So to me, how America moves forward, how the interfaith dialogue, Muslims, Christians, and, and Jews move forward, this is a challenge. And the last thing I would like just to say that I have realized that the seminary, Muslim seminary, are lacking in their curriculum subjects and courses on the law of change, the interfaith, global diversity, public diplomacy. And that's where my focus right now on this new seminary, I'm starting in Baltimore, Al-Bashir Seminary, to train imams on public diplomacy and global outreach. Stop talking only to Muslims. God is not talking in the Quran to Muslims only. God in the Quran is talking to the people, all the people, whether they believe in him or they do not believe in him. Whether they follow Prophet Muhammad or Jesus or Moses or Abraham, all of them. And the one who is going to judge in the day of judgment is almighty, not anyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Imam Arafat. Um, two weeks ago, we began this lecture series with a conversation about the religious impact on Middle East politics, specifically the Arab-Israel dispute. Last week, we looked at it more from an international perspective. And tonight, we're getting very personal. We're talking about teaching on a campus. We're talking about failures in um, different religious movements to bring people together to, to, to go with the change that the, the imam talked about. Yet, I want to take this back for a minute to Baltimore. There's, there's some unique things, and it seems to have been almost, well, pretty much substantiated by what Dr. David talked about. Throughout this country and, and throughout Europe, college campuses are very busy on the Middle East, or at least that's the impression we get when we talk about the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment movement, and the sanctions movement, all directed against Israel. And there seems to be, at least the public perception is, this, in, this intense focus among Arab students to promote these three things against Israel. Yet, here in Baltimore, and certainly at Hopkins, and some of the other universities in the area, it, it's not there. Um, the, the politics are relatively benign compared to other places. Um, you know, some, interestingly, some of the most potent BDS movements have been uh, in places like Brandeis, a strong Jewish university. And of course, many places that you would expect it to be. So is Baltimore different? And if it is, why is different? That is the universities in this area. And even, and by the way, the, the D.C. area has not been subjected to the kinds of rifts, problems, dissent, um, to some extent, uh, academic protests that many of the places have been. So from both your perspectives, why, Steve? Again, uh, I don't know what extent 
Baltimore is, is unique or distinctive. I will say at Johns Hopkins, we really do have open and civil dialogue. Uh, we're not having the kind of vitriol and, and hate-filled speech that I've heard has happened elsewhere. Uh, and, and that's nice to see. And I think it's a tribute to people mm -hmm. like the Imam and, uh, again, the Interfaith Center at Hopkins and Rabbi Debbie Pine, who really work to promote interfaith events, to inter uh, um, whether it be the breaking of, of, of the Ramadan fast, uh, or um, joint uh, holiday celebrations between the Muslim and the Jewish students. Um, I mean, of course, we have, I, I, I think probably the biggest controversies are within the Jewish community. Uh, the APAC supporters and the J Street supporters. Right. I mean, they'll mm -hmm. go at it uh, right. with, with a real intensity. Um, kind of reminds me, you know, Sigmund Freud talked about something called the narcissism of minor differences. And the worst conflicts, the most vicious conflicts, are not between people who are very different, but between people who are very much the same, with very little differences. And that's why civil wars are some of the most brutal that we face. But in the Hopkins community, I think the civil conflict within the Jewish community is far more intense than any conflict or animosity uh, towards the Muslim students. And I, I wish there were no conflicts at all anywhere, but it, it is gratifying to see uh, that we still have a campus where people can learn to disagree in a way that uh, isn't well put in. Okay. Um, since I uh, came to, uh, to Baltimore 23 years ago, um, and until this day, I really, I see the, the level of discussion and the level of uh, activities is different than other places. Um, I participated in the uh, caravan of reconciliation with Imam Hindi and Rabbi Jerry Sarota mm -hmm. uh, last month, and we went to, um, to the Eastern Shore. I was amazed when I went there, and just crossing the bridge, you, you feel as if you are in a completely different world, mm -hmm. uh, really. Uh, no like going to Dundalk, right? <laughs> <laughs> no interface. Oh they looked at me like, <laughs> Especially when I was speaking in Salisbury and here Rabbi Donald Berlin mm -hmm. stood right. up and said, Oh, Imam Arafat, you remember you came to my synagogue in 1993? That was right after the White, Law, right. I mean, the right. White House uh, on the law. Oslo. Uh, right. Yeah, the handshake. And at that time he wrote, uh, Imam Arafat is coming to uh, Beth uh, uh, Temple of Shalom. Mm -hmm. He wrote Arafat coming to Temple of Hope Shalom. That's what Arafat I remember that. <laughs> I do. So I, I really think that uh, this has to be uh, expanded, even though from my perspective, uh, still, you know, there are some groups on Park Heights somewhere, they are really not open at all for interfaith. I don't know mm -hmm. why. Uh, from the Jewish community. I don't know why. To me, they are... Uh, missing on something. The same way as some of the people in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. also they are missing on something. They have to open up, with my respect to all of them. Okay, thank you. Um, hold on, I'm, I'm going to do one more question and then I'll, I'll let Rabbi Grossman moderate the question. Um, next week we were going to have, as one of our participants, David Makovsky who is a renowned scholar on the subject, an academic. Um, he has been stolen away by the State Department and he's going to be replaced by another member from the Washington Institute of Near East Policy who's equally as good. But it reminds me of something that in terms of dealing with academics, uh, the academic role has throughout the history of this conflict has been to get involved in drafting peace plans and forming panel discussions and preparing all sides of the argument, talking to the newspapers, you know, Tom Friedman and whoever. Um, but the real question for me is, have you guys had any influence on any of this? The people, any influence? 
The people who often are the smartest ones out there, the people who are really asked to think about the issues, about bringing things together, bringing people together, devising peace plans. And almost every peace plan has had, and almost every president has filled his administration with academics who are there, quote unquote, to advise him. And in the end, what the brains come up with are sort of pushed away. You know, when I'm, we could talk about the, the white paper in 1939, we could talk about the Peel Commission report at the British level, we can talk about Oslo, we can talk about um, Camp David, we can talk, you name it, there have been major academics. And now, David Makovsky, who will be, who was to be here next week, is going, you know, he's another one. He, he has been brought in to help Ambassador Indic. He's going to be the number two person in, in advising. Indic is the major, the chief negotiator, um, intermediary between the Arabs and Palestinians in terms of trying to bring about a peace agreement within that, by April. And Makovsky is best known as the man who has the peace plans in his pocket, the maps. And he's put together probably the best maps on this subject. And you know, it's, it seems to be, wow, great, they're bringing in the guy who really knows something about how to divide up the land. But given the past history of the academic role in all of this, a moment was saying, oh no, it means those maps will be ignored. Your thoughts? Well, uh, I think individual academics have had an impact. Um, certainly Oslo came about largely due to the uh, influence of academics, but it's important to recognize there is not an academic view on the Arab-Israeli mm -hmm. conflict. Uh, Right. Noam Chomsky and Daniel Pipes are both right. academics, and I think that, That's right. you know, they wouldn't agree on very much. Because one is a linguist, <laughs> okay? Not a... Uh... Uh, well, be that as it may, probably, <laughs> Noam Chomsky is probably one of the most uh, well-known right. political scientists, if you want to call him that, uh, in the world. Uh, whatever his degrees might be. So uh, there isn't an academic view. Academics, I think, reflect the diversity of opinion uh, that exists uh, among the general population. Although, I think as a group, they tend to be probably more hostile uh, towards Israel mm -hmm. uh, than the uh, uh, general population. So uh, again, there isn't any specific academic view, mm -hmm. specific people, maybe David and his maps, which I think are remarkable. I mean, what his maps demonstrate, I don't know the exact percentages, but Israel, by taking three or four percent of the West Bank and incorporate like 80, 90 percent right. of the settlers, give back three or four percent of, uh, of 367 land to make the West Bank whole, if you want to call it that. And I think that is the path towards a settlement and mm -hmm. having someone with the expertise. And, and, and knowledge to come up with that kind of plan rather than just talking abstracts, I, I think is, is a wonderful thing. Uh, so, I mean, we'll wait and see if it has any kind of impact. But needless to say, even if you present a compelling plan, you can make an argument that the Geneva proposals uh, had a lot to it. They have to be accepted by your host government, the United States. They have to be accepted by the Israelis. They have to be accepted by the Palestinians, perhaps the greater Arab community. And that is a very order uh, mm -hmm. for any individual group. Thank you. Your mom? Um, I don't think, with my respect to you, that they are going to have a lot of influence when it comes to Israeli-Palestinian issues. They might have influence somewhere else, but not for the Israeli-Palestinian issues. Because it's hard. Uh, just go back to Oslo agreement. And, uh, uh, and then uh, when you see that what you speak about, and then when it comes to the uh, application of that on the ground, uh, because the people are watching, and the media is reporting, and now we have you know Al Jazeera Factor, you know, reporting every day. So if they are going to see something different than what has been promised or has been said that is going to be. Uh, applied, then the people are going to revolt. And mm -hmm. that's why you are seeing more uh, support for Hamas than the uh, 
Palestinian authority because the people are seeing that uh, uh, fine, what the academics are talking about is fine, but it is going to succeed when you are going to implement it on the ground. So when you are going to have some people are going to say, no, regardless, I'm not going to withdraw from here, then you are going to have a problem. Or when you say we are not going to build extra settlement and then you build extra settlement, then the people are not going to believe all those academics. I'm, I'm just speaking from what I'm hearing in the Arab streets and in other Muslim countries. So I think the academics are going to be always challenged by the religious groups on the ground. Rabbi? Questions? Yeah? The question is, are you speaking about reconciliation between Muslims and Jews, but can you speak about reconciliation between um, Shiites and Shias? Um, Shiites Sunnis. and Sunnis. Sunnis yeah. and Shias. The, the issue of reconciliation between Sunni and Shia at this moment is going to be hard. Uh, uh, before, there has been a lot of effort to, uh, to bridge these gaps. I grew up in Damascus under the uh, auspices uh, of the Grand Mufti of Syria, who used to invite Shia clerics, uh, and we always grew up to, you know, minimize these kind of differences because the the differences are really uh, not that much uh, because it's mostly political issues, and the people are able to understand that these differences exist, and they, it has been there for the past, by the way. 1400 years, the people learn how to uh, um, um, accept these kind of differences. But throughout the history, always has been, uh, you know, outside forces who were promoting uh, the Sunnah against the Shia or the Shia against uh, the Sunni. Now we are living in a time in the Middle East uh, where the Iranians are trying to have more influence and. Uh, uh, the Saudis are trying to have more influence and the people of uh, Turkey, but Turkey is different than the Saudis. But unfortunately, now we are seeing, and Syria is becoming the land of uh, this kind of struggle. Uh, we are all hurt by that, but I see it difficult right now to see uh, a solution for that. In the past 10 years after you know, the, the Iraqi war, we have seen that issue uh, you know, it's growing more and more. And all of these conferences, which uh, we have seen, and I was part of some of these conferences, proximity, we call it التقريبو بين المذاهب, proximity between the school of thoughts. Uh, unfortunately, all of these now, with, you know, are gone with what you see in Lebanon. I mean, yesterday, the Iranian embassy was uh, bombed. Uh, of course, uh, Lebanon and Syria, are becoming the grounds for all of these kind of influences by the Saudis and by the Iranians. Uh, I'm sorry to, to say that, but from what I'm seeing right now, uh, for these couple of years, it seems to be uh, these uh, extra forces from outside supported by other countries. Uh, Northern Syria, for example, now is almost uh, uh, occupied by these uh, Qaeda groups mm -hmm. and the Nusra groups uh, who are part of and affiliated with, uh, I, th I think they are the cousins of, of Al Qaeda, but they mm -hmm. are the same family. Um, I wish to see drones, you know, <laughs> killing those people. <laughs> but where are the drones to, you know, they, they are known where, where they are. So anyway, this is another topic for another <laughs> session. <laughs> But the Sunnah and the Shia is really a problem, and it has been always, you know, people other from, from outside will use this group. But theologically, we have been living with these differences because the Quran allowed the people to have their own views and uh, perspectives. Can I just comment on that? I mean, I, I would reinforce what the Imam said. Uh, I think this gets to a central issue. 
uh, with many of the problems in the Middle East, uh, that the Sunni uh, Shia divide. As many of you know, probably about 90% of the Arab Middle East uh, is Sunni, about 10% is Shia. And you know, people sometimes ask me, why is so much terrorism done in the name of Islam? And my own view, it has nothing to do with the Islamic religion, which I think is a gentle, tolerant faith. Uh, what it is, is that the Muslim religion has been hijacked by two countries. On the Shia side, you've got the Iranians, and on the Sunni side, you've got the Saudis, the Wahhabis. They've taken Islam, and I think perverted it, hijacked it, and the problem is they both have a lot of money, and a lot of power, and a lot of influence to spread this uh, vision, this communication of hate and intolerance and misogyny and anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and anti-everything throughout the world. And it's not Islam. I mean, you, if you had some of these ultra, ultra orthodox, you know, yeshivas like in the West Bank, just imagine giving them hundreds of billions of dollars to spread these yeshivas mm -hmm. around the world saying this is Judaism and pulling quotes out of context out of the Hebrew Bible to justify the most horrendous acts. Or someone says, imagine if the Ku Klux Klan discovered oil in Texas and was able to spread Christian academies around the whole <laughs> world saying, this is Christianity. That's what I think we have in the Islamic world. Uh, the fact, the, the horrible twist of fate that gave the Iranians and the Saudis all this influence to spread this vision of hate around the world. And now it's of course come home but you have this Shia-Sunni civil war. And the Imam can say, and I think there's justification in it, that the religious differences are in fact great. But again, you get to the mm -hmm. narcissism of minor differences. They're not that great, maybe looking at it from the outside, but to the people who are in it, they are very great. I, mean, I spent time living in, in uh, Belfast, Ireland. And you, even today, you've got the neighborhoods have these huge walls separating the Catholics and the Protestants. I'm walking around there like a, you know, as a Jew saying, what the heck's going on? They're, they're, they're all Christians. Okay, so one believes in the Pope, the other doesn't, big deal. Well, you know, it is a big deal to them. And I suspect for the Sunnis and the Shia, questions about who is the, you know, the proper you know, um, descendants of, of Muhammad and who, in whom is Islamic authority vested, whether it has to be a, a familial thing or, or not, from the outside, one can look upon this as, as trivial, but if this stuff is inflamed by the kind of seminaries, not the kind that you have, but the madrasas that the Saudis are spreading throughout the world, these kinds of minor differences become killing matters. I think that's what we're seeing today. And if I may say, that's why I'm really now focusing on these seminaries here in Baltimore, because we have to train imams. And as we are seeing now, Saudi Islam, quote unquote, Iranian Islam, quote unquote, I wait to see the American Islam. Uh, honestly, because the American Judaism, quote unquote, uh, even though some of it is not accepted in Israel, some of the rabbis, you know, would not be, I guess, uh, rabbis in Israel, some of the imams here, they might not be viewed you know, in other countries are legit imams. That's fine. But the younger generation is going to look forward for the American Islam. And this is, again, as a metaphor, I'm saying American Islam. Islam is, would not change. There is nothing called this Islam or that Islam. But I'm, taking, I'm talking about the practice of Muslims in America, that we don't care whether you are Sunnah or Shia. So many mosques here, by the way, the, the members of the board, Sunnah and Shia, all over the United States. Because here we go by the American Constitution. I don't care, you are American and I'm American. That's it. And in the mosque, by the way, so many mosques had problems, so they took each other to court, American court. And th they believe in the Constitution here. So we are all American. Now that, how, that's how it should be. You are all servants of God, whether you call yourself Sunnah or Shia. But I think, uh, I hope, that the community in the United States will take that kind of open-minded Islam, regardless of who you are, all over. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. David, you spoke about uh, a lot of professors are strongly anti-Israel. I've read about that as well. And I hope you could comment on 
genesis of how this academic anti-Israeli perspective seems to permeate a large fraction of American universities in higher education. You know, how did it happen, and is what is being done to counteract that to try to get a more balanced perspective? I mean, it's a good question. I, I can only give you my sort of impressionistic answer. Um, I think, first of all, most American professors are very much on the left end of the spectrum politically. Um, I am a kind of, you know, centrist Democrat. You know, I voted for Obama, and I, I'm, I'm on the right end of, 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 of any of these spectrums. It's the skewed political uh, allegiance. I mean, I think they once did some studies, I think at Harvard, uh, they're looking at political contributions have to record them by the IRS, I think like 98, 99% were, were to the Democratic Party. And as someone, again, who voted Democrat, that, that's not healthy. I mean, uh, it's better for universities to have different views fighting with one another than just one set of views. But that's the way it is. And uh, why academics lean towards the left has been the subject of a lot of speculation, uh, but it's a fact. I think another fact is the left tends to be much more hostile towards Israel than the right in this country. I mean, the people who are most supportive of Israel are conservative Republicans. Uh, that's not many Jews, but it's, I mean, I, if you want someone who's a steadfast supporter of Israel, get some evangelical guy in a pickup truck in Tennessee rather than some woman living over Zavars in, in, in Manhattan. <laughs> Given the, fa given the fact that, again, professors veer towards the left, there tends to be a certain, they would call it anti-imperialism, uh, but some uh, kind of hostile towards the spread of American or Western influence. Israel is seen as a colonial Western outpost um, in, in the developing world. And the third world, the developing world, is, is somehow lionized and idealized. That, these are the people you know, without problems, without flaws. They're, they're, they're pure and, and they're being corrupted by Western influence and culture. So, I mean, you, you will have uh, members of, of, of women's groups uh, who will condemn Israel uh, uh, for their actions in, in the occupied territories. Maybe justified, maybe not. You ask these same groups to condemn um, Arab countries uh, for their treatment of women for their treatment of gays, and you'll get very, very little traction there. So there is very much a double standard uh, practice, I think, in American academia. I but it wasn't, it wasn't there 50 years ago. Well, no, I think, no. I, think I, I would just say, things changed in 67. I mean, in 67, <laughs> Israel became a, a Goliath rather than a David. And, uh, but I think it's also part of this broader anti-Western chic uh, that permeates uh, academia. And I think a lot of it is unfortunate because it's one-sided, but it's very much there. Uh, but it's being fought. I mean, there, there, there are also many professors, not all of them Jewish, uh, who will push back on some of this. I should also say many of the most anti-Israeli professors also happen to be Jewish professors. So it is not a, you know, Jews versus non-Jews kind of thing. But there um, there was once uh, talk about Hopkin, uh, Hopkins um, uh, getting a journal that refused to allow Israeli contributors. And just word of this went through some of the faculty, and they said, if that's the case, we are not going to get this journal. We are going to fight back. We are not going to stand for this kind of uh, behavior. So there are, there are many people on college campuses who are pushing back. You know, people compare it to the apartheid movement in mm -hmm. South Africa. No one was pushing back uh, in defense of South Africa and apartheid. That's not the case uh, with Israel. It makes it uh, more problematic for those who want to do this BDS and other kinds of uh, boycott sanctions. Because the analogies are not equivalent. That's right. 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 It's, it's not the same thing. Uh, you want to respond? Okay. No, I think I'll.
desire, which can be looked on for 10 years. Um, and the difficulty with which um, the desire and unity between Israeli and Palestinian that exists. <coughs> we sort of have an idea of what the reconciliation of a Palestinian and an Israeli look, looks like. Um, we know what it looks like on paper, and we know what it looks like on maps. Um, what does a reconciliation and unity between a Muslim and Jew look like? Where, do, where does that come from? Where do we, as you know, my generation, you know, I'm 30 years old, um, you know, our millennial generation, I guess, would be the right way to term that. Um, what do we do to find that that unity? Um, I have my my family is from Egypt. Um, I'm going to repeat the, at least some of the very beautifully um, right. phrased questions. I apologize for summarizing it, um, but we want to have it on tape for posterity. Um, so uh, the question is, we've been speaking a little bit about the unity that's desired between Muslims and Jews, and the uh, what maybe seems a greater challenge in uh, determining unity between Israelis and Palestinians or around the issue of Israel and Palestine, and there's obviously many ideas about reconciliation uh, between Israel and Palestine and what that would look like on paper and on the maps, um, but the question is what would reconciliation between Muslims and Jews look like, particularly for the millennium generation, of which you were a member, a graduate of Appleton High School behind us, and uh, a, a American uh, Jew, your relatives come from Egypt, your family came from Egypt, and when they come to visit, they don't. They, they have a very different understanding and perspective, and um, a perspective changes when they see you're having Jewish friends and you're introducing them uh, to things. So, what would you say uh, to um, the millennial generation about what steps they can take, what steps we can take to help them uh, to bring about reconciliation between Muslims and Jews? Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for these wonderful questions. Uh, I wish other people from your generation could phrase it this way in different mass. You have to go back first to the history. When the Quran was revealed, there has been some you know, issues and, and tension during the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu with some of the Jewish community. But after the death of Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, until 1948. There has been no problem between the Muslims and the Jews. As a matter of fact, uh, they lived side by side. As a family. What's that? As a family. I'm going to ask people to please wait. If they uh, so, uh, have comments a, or questions, you'll raise your hand and I'll acknowledge yeah, As a matter of fact, they lived side by side in, in so many places. Uh, and the golden age for the Jews was in Spain, in Cordoba, under the rules of the Muslims there. And that was when we read about the Maimonides, for example, whom we call him in Arabic Ibn Maimun, and he studied under Muslim professors. So you have to distinguish between Judaism as, as a religion, as a theology, and Islam, and the Palestinian issue, which is just happened in the past you know, 60 and uh, moving into 70 years. This is a problem that we have to face and how to find a solution for this problem. But I'm talking also about the community here in the United States who never traveled over there or their parents came from that region. 
but really they have no problem with their Jewish friends in the schools in the United States. Uh, they are going to different uh, you know, uh, places, they meet together at the, uh, at the university here, the, at work. Those people, we owe them something that, look, this is a problem over there, but here we have no problem. And I really see here um, genuine efforts by the Christians, by the Jewish community toward the Muslim community. And a lot of people from the Muslim community, they like to reach out. That's why you see interfaith in America, I call this made in USA, is becoming really an American trait. Uh, so I should not let all the time the discussion about what's happening over there. It hurt me when I see the Palestinians killed, and it hurt me also when I see innocent Jewish people killed. But we have to solve these problems together. Unfortunately, some people, from my perspective, are not helping Israel when they are supporting others who are taking it all the way to the right, and they are not letting even like now, the uh, negotiations, which I will call, quote unquote, negotiations, uh, going on with the settlement, you know, right now, uh, spoiled everything. This is a problem. But what about us living here in America? That's what I'm talking about. That's why I created the Civilizations Exchange and Cooperation Foundation, this, in order to take students, when what I have seen at Hopkins, the Hillal and taking people to Israel. And at that time in the 90s, they said, oh, Imam, would you like to come with us? I said, oh, I have an Amer a Syrian passport also. And if I will go there, they would not allow me to go to Syria. But then I said, where are the Muslims in America who do trips also to Spain, to Morocco, to Egypt, to Indonesia, Malaysia, and other countries and speak and know each other closely rather than your grandpa telling you something and my grandpa saying something and his grandpa. Because when I have done these leadership programs for youth from different religions, I have seen a lot of them, they have never known that, wow, the Quran says this about us. I invited some Jewish students to the, to the mosque where I was Imam at Anur, and I prepared Qurans for them. And I told them open chapter, such and such, page such and such. One of the Jewish students, he said, I don't know if I'm reading the Torah or the Quran because it talks everything about Moses. They don't know. That's what I'm talking about. I should not let the Palestinian-Israeli issue uh, dominate everything. Thank you very much for both of you. Really for the discussion. question is, um, following up the conversation about the importance of interfaith um, dialogue, how do we bring that to the Middle East where the problems are, I guess, most heated? And uh, looking forward five to ten years from now, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Is there some hope for all of us? Well, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll do the pessimistic and you can do the optimistic. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'm not filled with hope uh, for the Middle East. Um, Especially, you look at history and what's going on now, we're moving in the opposite direction of interfaith dialogue. There used to be a robust Jewish community throughout the Arab Middle East, in Syria, in Iraq, in Egypt. They're gone, all gone. There used to be robust Christian communities throughout the Middle East, and they are dwindling, and many of them may become extinct. I think, especially with this Islamist wing of the Sunnis, again, financed and supported by the Saudis, they are extraordinarily intolerant. 
not only of, of Christians and, and the long gone Jews, but uh, of Shia. And we're seeing this acted out in, 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 in Syria. And the extent to which these groups are extending you know, frightens me. Uh, when I took my interfaith group uh, to Jordan, we met with the dean of the Islamic Law School in Amman. And it was me, a group of American students, uh, and the dean started lecturing us about 9-11. And what was he saying about 9-11? He was saying, well, 9-11 was not done by Osama bin Laden. This is just a crazy myth. 9-11 was done by the Jews. And he, had, and he has evidence of this. He has pictures of people celebrating Brooklyn and Mossad and the Jews. And I'm thinking, I know in America we've got a lot of people believing in a lot of wacky things. But you would be hard put to find the dean uh, of a law school uh, in that extreme of, of a belief, much less to announce it uh, to, to a group such as us. And from what I understand, according to public opinion polls, most elites in the Arab countries believe this kind of thing, believe this kind of pathology. So if that exists, and if we have a culture of intolerance that's feeding on itself and getting worse, I don't see much hope for interfaith dialogue. Now, I, I just wish everyone was like Imam Arafat, and then it would be a very different world and a very different Middle East. But I, I, I'm afraid that what you have are, are, are these extremists, including on the Israeli Jewish side too, who uh, have much more in common with each other than probably with any of us in this room, but they're the ones who are, are calling the tune. I mean, again, in Syria, from what I understand, Muslims around the world are joining the insurgency. But not, they're not joining the secular, tolerant Syrian groups, as small as they are. They're joining the, the Islamists, the extremists. That's the one that is getting them out of their comfort zone to fight in a civil war. And that, unfortunately, is a sad commentary on the way things are, and maybe will be. Did you want to respond? I've depressed everyone. You got to. You got it. You stopped it all. Um, I think there has been a question uh, by you, I guess, when you spoke about the academics, if they are succeeding. Uh, I think the same thing. Uh, when you talk interfaith, everything is, is wonderful to know one another. But then when it comes to uh, finding actual solution for the Israeli and the Palestinian issue, then it becomes really hard. Because, uh, again, you will see some who do not want to give back in order to make it work. Two-state solution, for example. And that's what you know, the people are saying, okay, let's see if this works. So again, uh, from what I have seen so far, you have people who are interpreting the religion according to themselves, that they are the only right. And I see it in Israel. I mean, I see it among some of the Jewish. And I see it also among some of the Muslims. So if they are the ones who are going to dominate uh, the, uh, the news, if they are the ones who are going to have more influence, I'm not going to be successful there. I think I can take the interfaith level to one, two, three. But then after that, four, five, six requires implementation on the ground. Some people are willing to implement it, and some people are really not willing to implement it at all. And I think they are, those people are going to be an obstacle for Israel, I think. For Israel, I like the extremist Muslims are an obstacle for the Arab world. And as I started my remarks, by the law of chain, I see uh, that this is going to be a disaster. And we have seen the groups right now who are going to the extreme in Egypt, in Libya, in in Syria, they are not succeeding, even in, in Pakistan, because this is not the way of God. The way of God 
is to be tolerant. The way of God is to be able to coexist with everyone. But if you want to you know, establish, like now some people will dominate something and they want to establish an Islamic Sharia right away. So what is Islamic Sharia? Like those people in North Syria now, they want to establish Islamic Sharia, an Islamic state. Okay, what is Islamic state? Forcing women to have a veil, not allowing women to go by, men's, by themselves, not allowing men to wear jeans. Not, uh, now, is this how the Prophet started Sharia? The Quran started Sharia by the word Iqra, read, to have education, to have development. Some people today, they have it all the way the opposite. This kind of you know, narrow-mindedness, whether it is among some Jewish or Christians or Muslims, they are going to be always a problem. So the question is to talk, uh, asking each of the speakers to maybe briefly uh, talk about the experience of teaching about Israel on the campus. I'd say it's, it's wonderful because the students really care about it. I mean, it's, so much of what you teach is an abstraction for students. I mean, now when you talk about the Cold War, you know, was that before or after the Peloponnesian War? You know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a different world, but Israel, the Middle East, uh, engages students, and not, not just Jewish students, Christian students, Muslim students. There's an, emo an emotional attachment to this, which you know sometimes can cause problems, but mostly, as you know, as a professor, you want people to care about what the subject is, and, and you want them to debate with you and, and among themselves. And, and what is a more fruitful area for debate uh, than the Arab-Israeli conflict? So I, I find it a joy uh, to deal with this. Uh, look, I'm, I'd like it to be resolved so I can teach it as history, not as political science, <laughs> but uh, it, it is a very exciting subject to get into. When I teach this, uh, this comes under uh, Islam in the modern time and America and the Muslim world. So most of my students who are taking my courses are really not expert and they are not intending to be expert on that topic. So I find it hard really to explain to them because you know, once I was in one of the classes talking about uh, Iran-Iraq war which was from 1980 to almost 88 and I kept going and talking and then one girl she raised her hand she said excuse me what are you talking about? <laughs> I said Iran-Iraq war. She said when did that happen? I said, I said, from 1980 to 88, she said, well, I'm sorry, I was two years old. <laughs> I'm not aware of this. And that's why also I said, you know, sometimes I say some terms for you and me, that's normal, because we hear it all the time. But I find sometimes some of the you know, college level students are really, it's hard for them to, you know, understand all of these, uh, changes and who did what and uh, when. So for me, when I teach my course, uh, it comes only one or two classes only. We're running out of time, so what I'd like to do, and I, I, we can only do this if everyone cooperates, what I'd like to do is take all three, only three people, I think, raising their hands right now, four. Four questions in a row, and I'll write them all down, and then I'll try to put them all together and we'll have our panelists respond to them, otherwise we won't be able to get to them. Does everybody agree to give brief questions? Everybody, all you four? Yes, sir. Okay.
Harrigan Show. What progress since Was uh, uh, I'm just going to repeat the question, then I'll take uh, the next question, uh, which is that the Israelis voluntarily left Gaza, and instead of uh, the, the building that up as either we would say you said the Palestinian state, but we might say part of the Palestinian state um, by with tourism and being on the on the water. Uh, instead, they were throwing rockets at Israel, which would of course engender a reaction. So why why didn't they use that as an opportunity to build? a positive view about how the Palestinians say could be a good neighbor to Israel. So Next why question. Don't or, why don't, or why don't they currently continue well, to? Uh, well, uh, that's, that's more common. That is more common to this gentleman and to this gentleman why we are not in Israel. We don't have the same relationship that we have here. And why you uh, let other people, kids, you come in and they don't understand how you live with the Israeli soldiers. Because here we live in the same culture. If you go to Egypt, open the book, Find Israel there. It's not there. Open the books in uh, Gaza. It's not there. Israel doesn't exist. We are we are the pigs and we are the monkeys in their books. We are supposed to be executed. This is why there is no there is no peace there. There will be peace here. I was in the military. I don't want I don't want anybody to go to to the war. I was in a war in 1982. I don't want anybody, not even my my enemy. But there won't be a peace until the education in the, those places. The United States pays so much money for them, to, for school, for learning, to teach. We are not there. We are, the Jews are not there. The Jews are under people, under dogs. This is why they, they, are, they come here and they say, we have peace for peace between you and I prefer to go to Egypt. Why? Yeah. My question is, okay. I have two questions to uh, this, this gentleman in the right. The first question is, how many times Jerusalem is mentioned in the Quran, and how many times it's mentioned in the Bible? Okay, so uh, the question was, uh, I'll repeat all these questions again for you before, but the comment was, <laughs> actually, I was going to raise a little bit of, of your test. comment, which was that the uh, part of the disconnect <sighs> we spoke about last week uh, with Harris Tarrant was, was raising up the issue of how both sides are not preparing their people for the potential for peace. No, and that's no, particular. No, no, Let me finish, inside. please, dear. Uh, the, the, but the real problem uh, would be in the Muslim world, in the, in the Arab uh, school systems, where Israel's not in the books and on the geographies. Uh, and the um, uh, as, as some of our past uh, speakers, and I'm sure our current speaker would say, the uh, uh, misappropriation of certain either Quranic or post-Quranic uh, references <laughs> to Jews and very um, critical and uncomplimentary ways as monkeys and okay. pigs. We see that on YouTube, uh, it's terrible. So that engenders hatred and tolerance and also makes it very hard for people to fit along in the different countries. Your comment was, how many times does Jerusalem appear in the Quran and as opposed to in the Bible? Last question is David. I'm sorry, you have to, you have to live with my summary. David. Right. <laughs> Please also briefly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's still a sweet It was a very exciting time uh, because there were parallel groups going on in uh, Hajj that uh, reflected what was going on in Israel. There were peace groups in, in Israel and there were peace groups in Hajj. The people worked together to try to motivate one another. And uh, those, those 
So the question is the collapse of the peace process, the collapse of the very active peace movement in Israel on the heels of the Second Intifada and, and the collapse of Oslo. Um, so the question is, what's taking the place of that, and is there a peace movement among, in Israeli universities and Palestinian, uh, and I might suggest in also Arab, other Arab universities, to be able to make that bridge? And I'm going to add a piece of that, which is uh, going back to our, again, our academic topic, which is the university being theoretically a place for open discourse and the tolerance of diverse views, uh, and how can we, what can we do to help facilitate that, um, A, as Americans, in exporting that uh, to the wider world, and be facilitating that around the world where there's been so much of the buy-in to the boycott and uh, divestment and sanction movement, which actually closes down the very kinds of dialogue and cooperation that would facilitate um, peace uh, in the future. So why don't we, why don't we start with that? Okay. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the book you spoke, yeah, the, the book you spoke about, uh, I'm not sure if we are moving forward or we are moving backward, I'm not sure. But we, uh, things are getting difficult uh, to resolve day by day uh, since 1986. Um, why the, uh, the, the, the people of Gaza do not build uh, you know, casinos and hotels and uh, travel agencies in Gaza? I don't know if they are going to welcome the people through the tunnels <laughs> coming from uh, Egypt. Uh, of course, as you know, you know, Gaza is one piece of uh, greater Palestine. So I think uh, it's part of, uh, of Palestine. It's not the entire Palestine. That's why they call it only uh, Gaza Strip. Excuse me, please. Please <laughs> that, that's restrain from, oneself. That's from, uh, from my perspective, I have never been there. Uh, and uh, to my brother over there, uh, it is really sad that we are seeing these words about uh, what you have mentioned, uh, uh, monkeys and apes. So, so it is mentioned in the Quran, but you have to understand the context when this was revealed, because it is the same Quran who told me I can marry a Jewish woman. So imagine if I'm going to marry ape or monkey. So that really has to be clearly understood how do you, how you read the Quran. Uh, there are verses in the Quran talking about the people of the book, uh, talking about outreach to the Jewish community and to the Christian community. And also there are verses talking in a negative way to the Jewish and to the Christians and to the Muslims. Not because of their religion, but because of certain things they have done, but not as a religion. So that's why the Quran spoke in a great respect to the people of the book. And also there are verses addressing certain actions, whether it is from the Muslims, because the Quran spoke bad about Muslims also. So I hope that will be clear. And the, the thing also you mentioned how many times Jerusalem was mentioned in the Quran. Jerusalem, by the word Al-Quds, was not mentioned in the Quran, but it's mentioned as Al Masjid Al Aqsa, the farthest mosque. And it was mentioned as the mosque. Not only Jerusalem, but the whole region. So it's mentioned, yes, in the Quran, mentioned twice. 
uh, in uh, a chapter 17 called the sons of israel or al-isra the night journey and also it's mentioned in the same uh, chapter again uh, about the mosque so it was mentioned uh, twice to my knowledge uh, what about the the organization uh, the organizations i would be delighted to work with these organizations whether from the uh, palestinian uh, campuses or the Jewish campuses because we, re we really need to uh, support this kind of effort. Okay, I'll, I'll be very quick. I mean, have things gotten better? I mean, you know, it's sort of like with any young man, how's your wife, you know, compared to what? I mean, it's, uh, I mean, in Israel, if, if you go to Israel now, people are pretty happy. The hotels are filled, you know, the streets are ablaze with light. And life is good. Uh, whether it's a fool's paradise or not is, is, hard, is hard to say. I mean, it's better, certainly, I think, in day to day life, but I can't think of a time where a peace settlement was less likely to emerge than, than the present. So, uh, on that level, it certainly isn't better. Uh, why can't Gaza be Palestine? Um, look, I, I share the questioners dismay that the Gazans reacted to the end of the Israeli occupation by launching hundreds, thousands of rockets. Uh, at, at the same time, I don't think it's realistic to think of, of Gaza being its own country. It, it is tiny, it is blockaded, um, and it's also run by Hamas, which my guess is is not going to set up casinos uh, anytime soon. Uh, as far as the Quran, you know, not mentioning Jerusalem, I mean, uh, so what? I mean, uh, so no, wait, so what? Well, check at the Shah. <laughs> Our point um, is civility, which is not interrupting. So look, please wait. You can talk to the speakers afterwards. Um, Jerusalem is holy to Muslims, the third holiest city in Islam. I know it's the holiest to Jews, the third holiest city to, to Muslims. To try and score debating points to make it seem like it's not holy to Muslims is silly right. and counterproductive. It's the place, it's the place where Islamic yeah, tradition believes that Muhammad ascended to heaven. It's holy to both Muslims and Jews, and in any negotiation, that has to be a starting point. And I share your concern with the incitement that uh, you have in many of the Arab countries where Israel is not mentioned, but the Israelis have to look at some of their history books and some of their maps also, because their examination of history and what happened in 1948 uh, isn't entirely uh, kosher either. But he was not sitting to cast the first stone. And I wish there were uh, more activities uh, on college campuses. I mean, Seeds of Peace, uh, colleague uh, Ron Cronish in Israel is trying mm -hmm. to promote campus uh, ties with Palestinians and Jews. Um, I think it is done on the local level, even if it's not done on the international level, uh, but we've got to do more. And, and one of the things that are undermining that boycott, we had a group of our students uh, were at Harvard and they went around, Jews and Arabs, went around Israel and they went to Jordan and they had a wonderful experience working with Jewish and then Muslim students, but they weren't allowed on the West Bank because they were, it was part of the boycott movement. So we have a lot of work to do, I think all of us, and I want to thank our speakers uh, this evening because they're part of the solution. Uh, not part of the problem. So thank you. I want to just uh, mention we have a, a change of plan. Our last session is this Sunday, not no more Tuesdays. This Sunday at 7:30, and uh, we were scheduled to have uh, Gaif Al Omari, uh, who is coming, who's the executive director of the American Task Force of Palestine and and include, uh, and in addition, the director of the International Relations Department of the Office of the Palestinian President, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, um, and he is coming. But we were planning to have David Makowski come, as uh, I think uh, Art mentioned. Unfortunately, he has been tapped uh, to uh, work on the peace process uh, as part of the U.S. State Department team uh, working with uh, Ambassador Martin Indyk. Instead, we will have Dr. David Pollack, David Makowski made um, arrangements for another important policymaker uh, to come. Uh, David Pollack uh, is uh, uh, previously the senior advisor for the broader Middle East at the State Department. 
Uh, he's focused on political dynamics in the Middle East. So come back with all your questions. That'll be a very wonderful time to uh, talk about all the issues that have been raised, and particularly near the end. And he's a frequent visitor to the region. He's just come back from a trip to Iraq, Kurdistan, and exploring the impact of Iran, Syria, and Al Qaeda on Kurdistan. Uh, so we have a and the, and the larger Middle East. So we've been we are again promising a fantastic experience on Sunday. Enjoy, please. Well, bring your friends and family. We will have high school students here as well. So we're uh, welcoming all of our high school students. We have some high school students here as well as college and post-college students, millenniums. We welcome you all uh, and thank you for coming. 7.30, Sunday night, the 24th. And again, a round of applause for our speakers.